So next, I'm going to introduce our um, um, opening keynote speaker. It's my uh, great honor to introduce Congresswoman Hailey Stevens. Um, Congresswoman um, Hailey Stevens grew up in Rochester Hills, uh, Michigan, and graduated from uh, Seaholm High School uh, in Birmingham, uh, Michigan. She earned a master's degree in social policy and, uh, and philosophy and a bachelor's degree in political science and philo philosophy from American University. Before electing to the Congress, um, Congresswoman Stevens served as the chief of staff for the U.S. Auto Res Rescue Task Force, a federal, a federal initiative responsible for saving uh, General Motors, Chrysler, and 200,000 uh, Michigan jobs. She also played a key role in setting up the Office um, uh, of Recovery for Automotive Communities um, and Workers and the White House Office of Manufacturing Policy. Um, after serving in the Obama administration, Congresswoman um, Stevens worked in a manufacturing research lab focused on the uh, future of work um, in the digital age. Um, Congresswoman Hailey Stevens sit on the uh, House Committee on Education and Labor and the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, uh, where she also serves as chair chairwoman uh, of the Research and Technology um, um, Subcommittee. I'm happy to say um, two years ago, I also testified before um, Hailey's uh, uh, subcommittee on University Transportation Center's uh, research. On these committees, um, Congresswoman Stevens works to protect access to health care and promote manufacturing, um, expand uh, education uh, opportunity, stand up for workers' rights, and increase investment in critical research and development. Um, Congresswoman Stevens resides um, in Waterford and attend um, Kingston's Church in Troy. Um, let's welcome Congresswoman Hailey Stevens. Well, good morning. Uh, what an honor to be in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan, otherwise known as Dingle Country. I am thrilled that you are going to be hearing from my colleague, Congresswoman Dingle, in a very substantive panel, given her leadership on the Energy and Commerce Committee and being so much a part of the late night phone calls that we make as members of Congress trying to tackle some of the challenges and the opportunities before us. And it's also a real delight to see our head of MDOT, Paul Adjaba, here today as well. And I know our Lieutenant Governor is uh, making his way uh, to, to speak before CCAT today. Um, also, to all of you in the room, Welcome back, uh, right? It's been maybe a couple of years since we've had the, the in-person uh, conference. I, I know that we've continued to do work digitally and online and through Zoom, but it, it certainly helps to go over and grab a cup of joe or grab the, the glass of water and, and have that side conversation, make those connections, do the networking that is so important to your work. And I'll also just share that a couple years ago, after Dr. Liu uh, testified before the House Science Committee, the Subcommittee for Research and Technology, on these very subjects that you are talking about today, it hit me that a, a pandemic, a shutdown, a stymieing of, of work posed some really big questions to our innovation enterprise. And so I said, as a subcommittee chair, well, let's not stop keeping our finger on the pulse of innovation, right? Let's not stop having the, the conversations that we need to have. And so we just started pulling together the researchers, the innovators who we know, the, the folks who are in charge of labs, uh, you know, moving to a Rolodex type of uh, format. And lo, lo and behold, about a month and a half later, uh, House administration called me and they said, Congresswoman Stevens, we're thinking about moving into remote hearings and we hear you've actually been having the semblance of remote hearings in your role on House Science. 
And I said, yeah, I guess we have been. And so now you see two years later, we have a hybrid format in the Congress for our hearings. And we also have an assessment about our innovation enterprise, about what you all are here to discuss and lean in and talk about today with automated vehicles and the, the future of work and the future of this technology, that the innovation didn't stop, right? Shortly after, or shortly before Dr. Liu came and testified uh, before our committee, the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee held a 50-year a mark from when we landed on the moon. And it was a really neat hearing to be a part of, right? Uh, reflecting on that moon landing, reflecting on that notion of a moonshot, reflecting on how a government comes together to do big things, to center around an exclusive mission. And I was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed new member of Congress in that year, right, from Michigan's 11th District, our, our Oakland County seat, home to the largest concentration of automotive supplier jobs in the country, right, shortly before we passed a big trade deal. And my question to all of my colleagues was, what's our moonshot of the next 50 years? And I, I really took that litmus test, and I asked that question even in the hearing. And, and the braggadocious point is that the moonshot is really what we're all here talking about today. The new generation of technologies that are coming in to our automobiles. If it's autonomous vehicle technology or electric vehicle technology. We know that this has been worked on and been talked about. I remember being at a, a large convention for a certain party in, in the year 2012, about 10 years ago, where you know, they were conceptualizing about the production and the proliferation of electric vehicles as well as autonomous vehicles and how these technologies come together and what that means for humanity. So you have an industry that's envisioning the safety rights of the user. That's part of what I think CCAT is focused on with autonomous vehicles. The notion that can we get to zero auto accident fatalities. As I was driving down this morning, it is National Worker Safety, Roadway Worker Safety Week, right, here, here in Michigan and across the country. And as I was driving down NPR, you know, it's talking about these roadway accidents, talking about just the helpless fact that you can be driving your vehicle and get in an accident and not return home. What we are envisioning are the tools and the technologies to help prevent that, to stop that. Driver roadway crashes, if it's head-on collisions, if it's cars, obviously the connected cars that talk to each other, the hundred millions of lines of code that go into every automobile, the software engineering component, these are things that hit this century. Is software engineering manufacturing? Well, obviously, yes, we now know that that question is, is a resounding yes. What does that mean for our automobile? And what does the rich history of which surrounds us as Michiganders mean to us? You know, we, we look to the, the turn of the last century, 1912, the nation's first highway materials testing lab opened right here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Let me say that again for the people in the back. The first highway materials testing lab. Are our roadways safe? Questions that we were designing and things that we were answering a, a century ago. The plight of materials that we are in right now. 1918, a police officer from Detroit inventing and installing our nation's first four-way red, yellow, green electric traffic light at the corner of Woodward and Michigan Avenues in Detroit. Congresswoman Dingle and I frequently brag to our colleagues what an exciting place that we call home is and what an exciting place it is from the rich history of innovation that also compels the work of CCAT, our university partners, and our industry leaders today. Uh, we know that in order to create a d domestic supply chain, we need to grow a market. We need to grow a market for electric vehicles. We need to grow a market for the new technologies. And that is certainly what we sought to achieve 
with our infrastructure package. You might have heard that Congress passed an infrastructure deal. It was signed into law before the end of last year, an investment in places, an investment in communities, saying that, yes, we will have access to electric vehicle charging stations. We will deploy those through grants. We've got to do the next phase of this, which is maybe a question that all of you will be uh, focused on today, which is the tax incentives. For the first time ever, you have industry, you have industry and nonprofits and environmental groups saying the same thing. Where and how do we invest? Our opportunities pose new challenges. We know that there are big policy questions before us, not just with electric vehicle technology, but also with autonomous vehicle technology, the safety of our consumers, the safety of our communities, and making sure that we are investing strategically and rightly, which is why I'm so pleased to be at a university that does that really well. It is also why I have a program called Manufacturing Monday, where every Monday before I fly out to Washington, D.C., I go and I visit with the makers of our communities, people who often say, oh my gosh, we've never had a member of Congress here. And I tell them, I say, listen, you help me keep sane because we get to geek out with what you're making and doing and I get to connect with your workforce, but also connect the docs back home. We could do that ad nauseum with all of you here in this room with the research, the innovation that all of you are working on and we really do encourage that openness uh, and that the openness of connection, the openness of understanding what you are working on, those complex questions, and we, we certainly encourage that as we're on the heels of the passage of the America Competes Act, right? Legislation that will invest in our supply chain, legislation that will invest in the National Science Foundation, something that I've championed, a doubling of scientific research in this country, and of course, this plight as we talk about investing in our supply chain, the securitization of our supply chain. We want electric vehicles, we want to see the autonomous vehicle technology proliferating and coming together, but where and how are we sourcing that? It is irresponsible to stand before all of you and not recognize the supply chain shortages that have been causing ricochets in our market, in our research. I've got those small to mid-sized manufacturers who can't fill purchase orders. They can't fill purchase orders because they don't have the parts components. We know an industry broadly is making money, is employing people, is doing well, is, is continuing to do things that frankly, in a, in, a, in a different life, in a different job, when I was working in the Obama administration and we were working on the largest managed bankruptcy, industrial bankruptcy in the nation's history, it was a thought experiment about how we do these things, how we would achieve electric vehicles, how we would achieve autonomous vehicles. Now it's here. Now it's here. Now we see the original equipment manufacturers investing. Now we see an entire university structure and research structure based on these opportunities. But how do we overcome some of the eminent challenges in a changing dynamic before us? I talk about materials, I talk about the chip shortage. We know that chips were innovated and invented here in the United States of America out of a university, 40% in the 1990s. That's how much we were producing of chips down to 13% today. A pandemic hits, supply chain disruptions, sport, port disruptions, and buying a new car is a much different experience in the United States of America. Buying a new car is more expensive. We want to talk about equity and inclusion as we proliferate and manifest an industrial internet of things, the connected car industry. What does that mean for the workforce? Who gets buy-in? Who has ownership? What are the startups that are coming out of maybe even your own university here and how are we making sure that is something for everybody in our workplace? This is something that I had worked on when I left the Obama administration and was in a research lab. Manufacturing diversity, diversity of people, minority inclusion. 
It's not just words we say, it's investments we need to make, which is why the set of legislation coming before the Congress and, and that we're working on in committee is going to take on that approach, saying, no, no, we don't just invest for the tippy top. We invest in an American workforce. We invest in chips production, which is complex, by the way. I'm a semiconductor enthusiast and spent more time in flabs than I'd like to admit. You know, it's a process getting into one. It's a process becoming a worker in one of them. We recruit the talent. We say that everyone matters. That's a big part of this charge, but that it is something for everyone. When we went through our exercise on the House Science Committee about how we are going to double scientific research funding through the National Science Foundation in the United States of America, talking to so many researchers, talking to so many scientists, I call it scraping the bowl, figuring out what we're missing. Everyone said the same thing. You're leaving American talent behind. We're leaving our own people behind based on geography and based on demographics. It's intentionality, which I know is a part of the charge of this conference, this two-day conference, of which I wish I could sit in the whole thing, by the way, because I know you've got some great speakers and some great technical topics. But it's that plight of intentionality, intentionality of our research, intentionality of our investment, and what these transformations mean, not just for our broader macro economy, but what it means for our micro economy. Make no mistake about it, Michigan will continue to be at the center of this glorious conversation. Our hard working men and women of the labor movement will continue to be at the center of this conversation. And we will remain optimistic, excited, delightful, and braggadocious from the halls of Congress about what we are innovating, what we are making, and what we are doing from the place that we call home. Thank you so much for having me today.